Well, welcome everyone. My name is Lindsay Durand. I am the marketing coordinator for Global Women's Health Initiative, and I'd like to welcome you to our first ever Facebook Live interview. Today we have board member Rebecca Stevenson, um, who's also the founder of Global Women's Health, Health Initiative, as well as Rachel Walk um, from Boston, Massachusetts. So Rebecca is a board certified women's health physical therapist. Um, in Newton, Massachusetts. She teaches nationally and internationally on topics of women's health physical therapy and specializes in obstetrics and pelvic floor disorders. And Rachel Walk is a physical therapist in Boston, Massachusetts, who practices in orthopedics and pelvic health. She treats male and female urinary, bowel, and sexual dysfunction. So we are happy to have them on tonight, um, talking a little bit about Rachel's work at Boston University and coming up with a whole education curriculum for middle school and high school uh, females related to sex education and pelvic health. Rebecca, it's all yours now. Well, thanks, Lindsay, for arranging this. And Rachel, I'm happy to see you again. Uh, just a little history. I know um, Rachel from her BU days when she was working on her doctorate. And I was very interested in the project that she did, which was the curriculum for young girls about sex ed, their bodies, and also self-esteem. And this is something that's very interesting for us, and we're thinking about uh, doing another project that would segue from your work, Rachel. So I was looking forward to interviewing you tonight to just give a little bit more depth as to how you started your project and what were the lessons that you learned because the Global Women's Health Initiative, our goal is to engage physical therapists and other healthcare providers interested in the care of women especially in underserved communities, both locally and globally. So tell us a little bit about the project. Yeah, I guess my project was born of a, a couple of different things. One, and this is the reason I also became a pelvic health physical therapist is because I have always been really passionate about decreasing shame, talking about an area of our bodies that can be really difficult to talk about, especially for middle school and high school age, but for women across the lifespan. So that was one motivating factor was to, to reach a, an age group and a population that might have particular difficulty talking about this area of their bodies, but probably has a lot of questions. Um, and also sort of born of, a, I found that as I was getting more interested in pelvic health, that a lot of uh, even practicing physical therapists didn't totally know what uh, what pelvic health physical therapy was. We were sort of this mystical, mm -hmm. do something really helpful behind closed doors, um, something to do with giggles. But uh, so if, you know, people in our own profession didn't know exactly what we do, how was our potential patient population supposed to know where to go when they were having dysfunction? Uh, so that was sort of where I was coming from, teach them young that, uh, you know, urine leaking is not normal and, and that there's something you can do about it. And, uh, you know, that's just sort of scratching the surface. So how did you get a particular population? What, what were the roadblocks that you had to overcome in order to get a group of um, young women? I was really lucky that the group that I got connected with had a uh, a really wonderful progressive woman leading their, the, the way for them. So she was really interested in getting uh, women from various different professions to come in and talk with her, her group of girls about their knowledge, their expertise. And she was very open to me, uh, sort of leading the conversation. And I let her know, I wanna talk about sexuality and gender and consent and show them pictures of vulvas and the muscles and she was on board. So I was really lucky the first time around that I got paired with a group who is already really into what I was doing. But uh, interestingly, the I think I met more backlash from the students themselves. They were like, I'm not sure if my mom wants me to know this. Um, and what was the age range of these um, young women? Uh, the youngest was sixth grade, the oldest was 12th grade. And you had them in different groups. I had them in different groups. And I definitely had some students who were taken aback at 
seeing, you know, an anatomical picture of a vulva, of superficial anatomy. Uh, and that was really striking to me that, you know, looking at body parts that we all have, uh, and, and not in mixed company, it was, it was all a cisgendered women or girls. Uh, it, there was a lot of shame there, even just looking at a, an anatomical picture, which sort of made me think, well, we really need to be doing this then. Right. right. One of the things that I uh, thought was very interesting that you developed as part of your project is you did a pre and post test. Say more about that. Uh, my pretest was developed from a test that I found uh, as I was doing a literature review beforehand, but I uh, basically just assessed baseline knowledge that the girls had of uh, anatomy, physiology, and hygiene. And what I found in the pretest was that the majority of my girls couldn't identify where urine exits the body. About half of them could identify the vagina. Uh, so there was a, a pretty stark knowledge deficit here. Um, and also uh, the majority of them uh, said that it was normal to leak urine at least some of the time, like if you are running or jumping. So by the end, we did have a big uh, increase. I'd be curious to test them like a year out to see if they retained it. But uh, by the end of our project, we did see that uh, they were much better at identifying superficial anatomy. They could uh, distinguish that urine doesn't come out of the vagina, it comes out of the urethra. So uh, we did see a really big improvement in their scores, but I would so be curious to see how long they retained that for. So say a little bit about how you divided this, uh, how long a time did you see them for and how long were your presentations to them? I had five different sessions and we met once per week for between one and two hours. Um, the first day was spent sort of keeping this general and relationship building. Uh, and we focused largely on emotional and physical changes that accompany puberty. Um, all of our discussions were, were very much discussions. It was not lecture-based so much as uh, sort of giving a leading, guiding, facilitating question and, and sort of letting things unfurl from there with the conversation, you know, guided by me <laughs> along the way. Um, but about, about an hour each time, once per week, and I, we spent one week on puberty one week uh, specific to pelvic floor and a little bit more anatomy and physiology. Uh, another week was devoted to what healthy and healthy relationships might look like, uh, including conversations on consent. Uh, and another week on birth control, which was super fun. We, uh, we made commercials, so they were divided into different groups and they had to make commercials for different types of birth control so that they could teach the rest of the, the group about uh, the pros and cons of the IUD or abstinence or the birth control pill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, have you heard back from any of those, the teachers or the participants or so what was the summary at the end? How did they feel? Um, summary at the end, let's see. I left the state in the months following. So I kept in touch via email, but unfortunately didn't see them again because I was off on clinicals. Um, but I was invited back to uh, see their final dance recital as they were sort of a, they were an after school program. So they had diverse interests. So uh, I was invited back, but unfortunately uh, didn't really get to follow up because I wasn't in the state anymore, um, <clears throat> which is a bit of a downer. So one of the things that we're thinking of doing with GWHI is taking that program to possibly uh, collaborate in other communities uh, in the United States that are also underserved. What might you think of some of the potential obstacles that might be in different cultural groups or religious groups that uh, we would have to look into in, in order to develop a program that was sensitive to a specific population? The obstacles that I foresee uh, are largely that I think 
of the many different cultures that exist within the US, many of them are uncomfortable with the female body and with confronting it, teaching about it, uh, and teaching about its power. We're uncomfortable teaching uh, high school age girls that some of you may choose to have sex, uh, not for procreative reasons, but because it feels good. And if so, then you need to learn how to protect yourself against unwanted consequences, uh, unplanned pregnancy, STDs. Um, but I, I do think that we're sort of uncomfortable as a culture and, and across many different cultures, teaching that sex has many consequences. Some of them, those bad ones, some of them are good ones like relationship closeness and physical pleasure that that it's not all sort of a, a demonized act. So I think coming at it from that approach might be unfortunately controversial. Um, I could also foresee there being some challenge discussing gender, sexuality. That's another topic that uh, in a lot of different cultures, we have different, different comfort levels with it. Uh, but I'm hopeful that Programs like this can help can help open the door to uh, bring everyone's comfort level to approximately the same. That we can all get a little bit more comfortable, uh, like Lindsay putting her pronouns down there, which is awesome. Um, that we can start getting a little bit more comfortable with these little tiny changes we can make on a day to day basis. Yeah, at TWHI, we really want to work on solutions that are sort of paving the way for a healthy path for young girls and women of tomorrow. So this sounds like this is actually quite an alignment of that. Can you share some of your uh, slides that you used with uh, your program? I can. Um, I will pull up just a brief little uh, cartoon that I made with my endless uh, Photoshop skills or rather word processing skills um, about what happens when we decide not to pee. Um, so a bit geared at a younger crowd, but you see uh, you've got the bladder here sending a message to the brain saying, I've got about, I'm about 75% of the way full, can I pee here? And then sort of depicting the process that it's not all just a, a muscle and bladder thing. There's there's some cognitive function that goes into this too and some volitional control and your brain assesses the situation, decides this isn't socially acceptable for me to pee here. I'm perhaps I'm in the middle of class or I have clothes on um, and relays that back to your pelvic floor and gives instructions to your pelvic floor. And basically sends those directions down saying, detrusor, don't push any urine out, pelvic floor, stay active. We're, we're not in the right place. And any, anywho, there are more slides that uh, show what happens when we do want to pee of the brain assessing the situation and saying, I'm, I'm on a toilet, there's no one around me, my pants are down, this is a good place to pee, you can go ahead and do it. Uh, so trying to make it a, a little bit more fun talking about uh, bladder control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but showing them the anatomy, the physiology, and all of the things that go into actual voiding, and I'm sure you did defecation as well. Um, yes, and I can I can show a quick picture of you know some of the anatomy that we uh, we might have looked at, and some of the very pictures that is such a such a stir. Um, for example, a picture like this showing the superficial pelvic floor and better. The, the anus and the vagina and the urethra. Uh, so even something as sort of a non-sexual and, and scientific as this felt truly scandalous. Uh, the first time we were, we were looking at pictures with my group. So uh, I think it shows that we have a long way to go to get, to get women and girls uh, comfortable learning about and interacting with and owning this area of our bodies. So if you were working, um, uh, doing this in the future, what sort of lessons did you learn out of doing this? What did you get out of this and what sort of lessons did you learn? Um, I think I learned perhaps the uh, 
something that my husband, who is a teacher, uh, knows every day, but uh, sort of keeping the whole group engaged when you've got some who are really into it and some who are uh, super knowledgeable already, others who are uncomfortable or others who are just not having it that day. They're having a bad day and they don't want to learn with you and, and sort of putting a whole group on, on your same page is a skill that as physical therapists, we don't have to, we don't have to do that often. We're usually one-on-one. -on -one. And um, people are really pretty engaged. And people are usually quite engaged. So uh, that was definitely just a personal lesson for me. Uh, and something that I think I will continue to work on. But uh, the first time I presented this, I was a student physical therapist. So I hadn't had even much pelvic floor experience myself. So at this point in time, I think I would bring to it a bit more nuance discussing these things and perhaps a uh, have a bit more to draw on uh, discussing it with people who might not be comfortable with it. Well, it sounds like it was a very bold and courageous project, and we certainly applaud you and look forward to uh, partnering with you in maybe some different situations. Uh, hopefully, COVID uh, will pass and we may be able to actually do some in person. Um, Someday. Hopefully, more effective than all our Zooming. Well, thank you very much. That's all my questions. I'm turning it back to you, Lindsay. Rachel, do you have anything else you want to say on your experiences? Um, anything else we didn't cover that you'd like to mention? I think Rebecca covered the long and short of it. I guess the one thing I will say for the record is that as a student, I got my boldness and my courage from the fact that uh, Rebecca Stevenson was my project mentor. I, Badgered her into mentoring me, and uh, she was a big reason for its success. I love that. <laughs> I think she's been an influential uh, person for a lot of people. So sure has. it's cool to meet those individuals. All right. Well, we will go ahead and wrap up the live interview at this time. Be sure to like, share, um, subscribe to our newsletter. All those links can be found in our bio. This video will be available for replay um, and be watching for our next newsletter coming out soon.